Hallelujah. Jehovah, the self-existent one who reveals himself. Uh, we often pray the Lord's Prayer and we talk about hallowing the names of the Lord. Uh, when God introduced himself to Moses, he didn't really introduce himself. He said, follow me to a place that I will show you. Uh, Abram didn't know what to call God. He came from um, uh, a heathen background where they had a pantheon of gods. And, and he didn't know what to call God. And there came a point in his life uh, where God had spoken to him prophetically about a son that he would have. And uh, they, they kind of messed that up. But then uh, Isaac came along. And you remember he took Isaac up on the mountain. They walked three days. He was about to sacrifice Isaac. And Isaac asked a faith-filled question, a prophetic question. He, he said, Father, he said, I see the wood, I see the fire, but where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham spoke something. He said, Son, he said, the Lord himself shall provide a lamb for the sacrifice. And so they get up on the mountain, and, uh, and he's about to slay his son. And, and, uh, and the angel of the Lord appears unto him, a theophany, and says unto him, For now I know that my servant Abraham does fear God. And he turned and he looked, and there was a ram in the bush. And he said, I know what I will call him. Jehovah. Jireh, the Lord whose provision shall be seen. What I'm telling you, when you say the self-existent one who reveals himself, God is still revealing himself to us. He said, I am the great I am. I am that I am. And so in different situations of life, he manifests himself as a healer. He will manifest himself as a deliverer. He will manifest himself as a counselor, as a keeper. That is who he is, and you will never exhaust all of who he is. He is the great Jehovah, and he is worthy of glory and honor, majesty and dominion. It belongs to him 24-7. There are cherubims and seraphims that surround his throne, and all they do is they say, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. He is an awesome God. Why don't you give him praise this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, our time is 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 far spent but uh, I told y'all we we getting ready to roll a, a, a different way and uh, I also want to acknowledge the Bible says give honor to whom honor is due not only is Pastor Bracy here but his lovely wife Dr. Levon in that beautiful yellow is he I hadn't seen you in a long time how you doing mother Bracy and I thought I saw Senator Randolph Bracy y'all just give him a round of applause God bless you <laughs> hallelujah amen are you all ready to get into uh, the word of the Lord for today? Uh, I have wrestled with this word all week. I gave it to you. We started last week, and I wanted to move on. But like I said, I have labored and wrestled with the Lord has just kept me there in the same place. And it's so important because we're going to talk about some deeper things. It's going to seem like a review, but we're going to talk about some deeper things today. In 1992... Um, the Lord called me years ago. I had a, a, a spree of five years where I had backslidden. I was doing everything. Rededicated my life in 1990 and uh, to the call that God had placed on my life when I was 25. And, and I was praying at my home in Miami. And back in those days when I prayed, uh, I prayed prone, laying on the floor, hands stretched out. Uh, that was my posture of prayer. And, and I was praying one day, and I never will forget this. The Lord spoke to me. He said, I have called you and I have raised you up to be a teacher and a prophetic voice to my people. Now, that was a long, long time ago. But recently, in the last couple of months, the Spirit of God continues to revisit me and to let me know that God is shifting the focus of my ministry into a different arena, a different dimension. It's going to seem strange to some of you. Um, it, it seems strange to me what God is doing. But I said all of that to say this, the, the word that's going to go forth today, if you have any type of prophetic gifting or any type of prophetic anointing upon your life, your baby's going to jump. <laughs> your, 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 your spirit is going to be turning somersaults today. Um, because again, not only, if God shifts the man, he shifts the entire house. You see? And, and I've been telling you this, the last two years were not an accident. And there is a whole lot of stuff that is happening right now. And we look at the natural. 
uh, we, 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 look at, we, we look at what's happening in political arenas. We look at what's happening in economic arenas. Uh, we look at geopolitical unrest and whatnot, but many of us are not looking at what's happening in the spirit realm because what you're seeing outwardly is a manifestation of things that are going on in the heavens. And that's why I said it is so important in the season that we're in that you train your ear to hear the to hear the voice of God. And so we're going to go deeper into the teaching uh, that we started uh, last week on hearing God. That being said, let's go ahead and pray this morning. Father God, you are magnificent. We don't even have the words really in our vocabulary to fully express who you are. We don't have the mental capacity in our natural being to fully comprehend the fullness of who you are. The Bible tells us so many things about you, and one of the things that the Bible says is that you are not a man. The Bible tells us there are certain things that the Bible says definitively about you, Father. It says that God is, God is love. God is light. God is a spirit. And so, Father God, we come before you knowing nothing today, just ready to receive whatever the Spirit will download. And so prepare our hearts to receive, we pray. Now, God, the only reason that we are still here is because before we were ever born, before the earth ever was, you had already seen us. You had already given birth to who we would be in the Spirit. You told Jeremiah, before I formed you, already knew you. I had already called you. I had already set you aside for a purpose and a plan. And so, Father God, I ask you that the thing that you saw me doing before I was ever given my name, the thing that you purposed and planned that I should do in eternity, I pray that it would manifest here in this present time. And in so doing, your name would be glorified and your people would be blessed and refreshed. We pray, O oh God, today that you would allow the word to go forth, revelation, knowledge, unhindered, or uninterrupted by any satanic or demonic force. We thank you for it, and we believe that we have received everything we just asked for in the wonderful, the marvelous, the majestic name of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And all of God's people said, amen. Please take your Bibles or any electronic devices that you may have, lift them up, and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I can do exactly what it says I can do. I am a believer. I'm not a doubter. I am a doer and not just a hearer. This is the word of faith for my life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I shall be all the better after having heard God's word. Amen. How, how many of you know that the spiritual dimension is real? I'm going to say it again. How many of you know that the spiritual dimension is real? Um, and again, because of the urgency of the hour that, uh, that we're in, it is very important that we uh, learn how to hear God. But before I go any further than this, let's go ahead and take our two foundational scriptures. One came from Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number four from memory. Uh, Thou has given me the tongue. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know. Stand up, y'all. Y'all know how we do. I'm, 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 I'm way ahead of y'all in my teaching right now, and that's why I'm doing this the way that I'm doing. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. Now pay attention. He wakens morning by morning. Say that again. Early in the morning, what does he do? When does he do it? You remember I told you that one of the easiest times and the best time to hear the Spirit of God is early in the morning while your soul is still quiet. Because when you wake up and you start maneuvering and engaging the day, all five of your physical senses are hitting at 100%. Sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, they're all fired up. But when you are asleep, when you are at rest, your soul is at rest and your soul is quiet. And so what he does is morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear. Why? So that I will know how to speak. Do you see what I'm saying? No, you don't. You heard what I'm saying. I said, do you see what I'm saying? 
When you see what I'm saying, you'll get it. All right, now, let's go ahead and go to the next verse and read this. And, uh, and this is the account of this young boy who his mother had prayed for. And uh, he is now been, she's weaned him, she's taken him back. He is ministering uh, to the Lord under the tutelage of a high priest whose name is Eli. And he has this supernatural experience that he cannot understand. And when God first speaks to him, like many of us, he, he, he says, is that God or is it my mind? But because he didn't know to do that, he went to the spiritual authority, this is so important, that was in his life. He said, you called me. He said, no, I didn't. He said, go back and lay down. Now, because the spiritual authority wasn't sharp where he should be, it took him three times before he perceived what God was doing. And so this is the account of Samuel's call into the prophetic ministry. So let's go ahead and read this. And the child Samuel... Mm -hmm. And his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp... The Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. And he ran to Eli and he said, here am I, for thou callest me. He said, I call not, lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. Mm. Now, read verse 7 again. That means that there's some be, there, there, that, that means that there must be some correlation or some connection between knowing God and His word being revealed to you. OK? Next verse. And the Lord calls Samuel again. Mm -hmm. Next verse. You may be seated. One of the tragedies of this particular text, if you read the narrative all the way through, um, is when you find out what the Lord was talking to this young prophet about for the first time. Do you all know what he was t telling him about? Uh, because the next morning, Eli said, tell me what the Lord showed you. And um, basically what the Lord had said is, you are condemned, your house is condemned, your son is condemned, and you all are going to die because you did not perform your priestly duties as it relates to correcting your sons because of what your sons were doing in the ministry, and you did esteem your sons higher than you did me. Therefore, you are going to die, your sons are going to die, and your male descendants are going to die. Uh, if you want to check it out, just read, keep reading it. It's right there in the passage. Now, you remember last week I told you I said that here is the thing, because God is always talking. The problem is, is we don't know how to hear God. Um, and I, and I, I, you remember I gave you the example? I said that there are hundreds of thousands of waves, radio waves, with different frequencies that are moving through this room right now. And not a single one of you in your natural self, in your human capacity, can pick up on one of those waves. But if we were to bring in, let's say, a satellite radio, then all of a sudden those frequencies can be picked up. There's a frequency that I'm speaking to... <laughs> Jesus, do you? <laughs> There's a frequency that I'm using to communicate with you right now. And a lot of times we get interference on that frequency because there's so many other electronic devices that are on that frequency. But if I have, if I have the right equipment, I can pick up the frequency. And so when the Holy Ghost, <laughs> oh, I need y'all to find this scripture for me. Jesus said he will take a mine 
and he will show it unto you. You see, what the Holy Ghost does, he allows you to pick up on one particular frequency, and that is a spiritual frequency, because heaven is broadcasting 24-7. And so the Holy Spirit allows us to pick up on what heaven is saying, because God speaks to it. Don't let, don't let folk tell you, don't let religion tell you God doesn't speak. People told me God doesn't speak to sinners. That's a lie. Paul was on his way to have Christians thrown in jail, and God spoke to him. You had uh, Naaman, the Juju man, was, was getting ready to go and, and, and try to curse Israel. God spoke to him. You had an Egyptian king who was a sinner that took Abraham's wife. God, he said, didn't you know not to touch him? You see, so one of the things, when you talk about hearing God in frequencies, one of the things you have to be careful of is noise. Noise, spiritual noise, stress, anxiety, anger, these emotional things that get us all out of the spirit. But then God, I told you I've been dealing with this and the Lord's been working with me all week on this. Let me tell you another type of, of noise, spiritual noise, religion. Religion can't hear the Holy Ghost. It'll, see, the, you, you, here it is. It, when you put God in a denominational box or a traditional box, don't you know God is bigger than your box? Here you have a Messiah. The oracles of God were given to a nation called Israel. And throughout the history, the promise was given of a Messiah that was coming, a Messiah that was coming. But when the Messiah showed up, they didn't even recognize who he was. You see, and so the question has to be asked, what if he showed up today? Would we recognize who he is? And so it's important that we learn how to hear the voice of God. And so I want to go a little bit deeper and, and talk to you about a couple of things because what the devil will always try to do is confuse your hearing so that you don't hear God. Once again, I want to ask this question. How many of you have ever said this? Is that God I'm hearing or is that my mind? When we get done with this, I want you to know for sure. I want you to be able to distinguish between what is your mind and what is not your mind. Find the scripture. We discussed it last week. For the word of God is quick, alive, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder uh, the, the, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it talks about dividing the soul and the spirit. Uh, where is that? It's in Hebrews. Huh? Give me Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick. That does not mean it's fast. What it means is it's life-giving. Jesus said, my words are. He said, <laughs> first of all, they're spirit. See, you missed an important part. The word of God is only designed to do one thing, feed your spirit. It does not feed your soul and your intellect. You can only go so far with God dealing with soulish things and intellectual things. The spirit deals with your spirit. It is spiritual food that sustains you. And so when my spirit receives that which is spiritual, my spirit, my spirit becomes stronger in God. Yeah. Tell somebody there's levels to this. Yeah. See, as you begin to engage the Word of God, how many of you have read the Word of God five years ago, but now you look at it differently five years later? Yeah. You see the same scripture. You looked at that, all, but now it, it speaks to you differently because there's levels. Yeah. God, you better, you better hear me. There's levels to what I'm telling you. And what God is trying to do is he's trying to take you to a different level. Okay, now, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pistol, and dividing the soul and spirit. Here's the problem. Remember, the word is spirit, okay? But it cannot, okay, go back to the original text. He wakened me, he, he wakened me morning by morning so that my ear can hear, okay? Now, when I hear it in my spirit, because God does not speak in an external dimension, it's an internal dimension. When I hear it, I gotta process it. That's the problem. That's why you said, is that God or is that my mind? Because you heard it. <laughs> Don't let your head cancel what your heart knows. Now, you want a nugget. That's a nugget for you. Don't let your head cancel what your heart knows. Because knowing it in your spirit and your head wrapping around it sometimes can be problematic. Because what God speaks, God, God says things that don't make any sense. You see? And so sometimes you have to put it on the shelf and wait and allow the Spirit of God to minister to you before it's revealed and before it's exposed. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Okay. Now, so let's go ahead and take a look at something three and one. First Samuel three and one. This is what I want to go back and talk to you about. The Bible says that the child Samuel ministered before the Lord Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. Say rare. rare. Okay. They didn't have a King James Version. 
They didn't have an NIV. Um, they had the word of the prophets and the word that was revealed to men of God of old back in that time by the Holy Spirit, but there was nothing that was written there. And, uh, and the Bible says that the, the word was precious, rare in those days. Now, here's the thing. How rare, how precious is the word of God to you? Now, what I'm trying to get at and what I'm trying to show you is that God reveals himself in his word. And that revelation that you get through reading his word is not a one. I'm still reading the Bible, and I'm going to keep on reading it. I'm telling you there's levels to this, and the more you read it, the more you're going to see God, the more you're going to know God. How, let me give you a simple example that will help you understand what I'm trying to convey to you today. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Color Purple? Do you remember at, at one point, um, Celie was given a box filled with letters that her sister had written, and she and her sister had been separated for years, and she didn't even know where her sister was. And come to find out that her sister was over in Egypt traveling with some missionaries. And do you remember the scene where she sat on the porch and she began to read those letters? And, and, and Steven Spielberg did an amazing job because while she was reading the letters to try to show you how she was realizing what she read, he, he showed scenes of what was happening, and, and she was so engrossed that she was actually there experiencing what her, she was so engrossed in it. Y'all remember when, when Mr. came out, woman, didn't I tell you, pow! Y'all remember that? And, and Celia was, was upset because she was, she was in a place, you know, yeah, he, he didn't know. <laughs> Celia had had enough that day, <laughs> right? <laughs> but my point was, when you begin to engage the Word of God and you read the Word of God, the more you read it. The, it it's, it's, I'm telling you, God brings you into the place, into a place in the Spirit of God. You begin to understand God and know things about God and realize things about God that you never would have imagined. Keep reading and keep studying because it's layers, it's layers, it's layers, it's layers. And the more you read and the more you study, the more you will be able to identify. And you will stop saying, is that God or is that my mind? Your spirit will readily let you know that's God. See, God says stuff I'm too smart to think of. That's one reason I know it's him. I couldn't think of the stuff that God tells me because it just blows my mind. Now, let me show you something else. Now, 1 Samuel 3.21. And okay, I got to straighten out an error because I taught you all something that was an error last week. I'll, I'll straighten it out when we get to the third verse. Uh, but it says, and the Lord appeared again in Shiloh. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh. How did he do it? Read it again until you get it in your spirit. Read it again. So how does God reveal himself to us? He reveals himself to us by his word. How many of you want to know who he is? Well, why, you stop? why don't you read your Bible? Let me ask again. Let me come over here. How many of you all over here want to know who God is? All right, now ask yourself, how many times last week did I pick up the Word of God and engage it? I'm not talking about just reading a couple of scriptures. You've you got to understand how this works. It's not quantity. It's not reading three or four books a night. That's good if you want to do that, but it's quality. God will hold you on one verse for weeks. See, and if you get into that thing, you know, those Bible reading plans where you want to read so much, you know, per day, you'll miss, you have to be careful with that because God will hold you in a place. Because he builds upon the revelation, Jesus, he can only build upon the revelation that you have. He cannot take you beyond a revelation that you don't have. And see, many of you wonder because it seems like, and you're frustrated by this, because it seems like you're not going to the next level. He can't build upon a revelation that you don't have. He talked to the disciples. He said, who do men say that I am? Some said you're Elijah. Some say you're that prophet. He said, I'm not concerned about that. He said, I want to know who do you say that I am? Peter said something that blew Jesus away. He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He said, Simon Peter, he said, flesh and blood. Y'all better hear what I just said. He said, this revelation that you just received, it did not come by way of flesh and blood. He said, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this unto you. God still wants to reveal himself to us, but you're going to have to get into your word, okay? Now, uh, 
Where did I tell y'all to go? Uh, 1 Samuel 3, 21. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Psalms 119, 30. Revelation. Okay, Psalms 119 and 30. We didn't talk about this. All this is new scriptures. So it seems like I'm, I'm teaching you the same thing, but it's new. I know the psalm says something other than that light. <laughs> okay, now pay attention. The entrance of thy word gives light. Okay, now remember I said it's levels and degrees. Okay, the entrance of thy word gives light. You've read the other scripture, the, the word of the Lord is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Most of y'all read that, you don't have a clue of what that particular scripture means. And what made it real for me is I'm a country boy and I came from the country. And I, and I know about lanterns. See, y'all know about flashlights. I know about kerosene lamps. Somebody go, oh, this man is ancient. No, we, we lived in the country. We had kerosene lamps, and you had to trim the lamp, okay? Now, with the kerosene lamp, if you go outside where it's dark, you can only see so far because that's all the light that you have. But it's, it is enough light for me to put one foot in front of the other, you see? And so the entrance of his word gives me light, which means the more I let in, the greater the light that I have. And the more light that I have, if I have more light, in, now I'm not saying that I have more Holy Ghost. Don't, please don't screw that up. Excuse me. I, I get that all messed up because church folk mess up stuff. What I'm saying is, is the more you read and the more you grow in the things of God, the more light you have, the more light you have, the more you can see. Now, when I tell you there's levels to this, you keep walking with God and God will show you things around you that other folk can't see. Now, I know you think I'm crazy, but some of you in here know exactly. You can be talking to somebody, and while you're talking and listening to them, there is another conversation that's going on in your spirit, and you'll be standing there going, mm-hmm, yep, but I'm hearing something else on the inside, and when I walk away from you, I'm going to give more weight to what I heard over there than what you just said, because what I heard over there came from a God who sees all, who knows all, and he said he would order my steps in his word. He's going to protect me, so I need to listen more to him than you. Okay. Now, let me show you something else. Uh, numbers, 12 and 6. I'm teaching you all of this because, ooh, um, there is a prophetic mantle on this house, and it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger because we're talking about how to hear God. Now, there are several things and several ways that God will speak to you. It's not just his word. Sometimes God will speak to you with dreams. How many of you have ever had Holy Ghost dreams? Okay. I can tell you every single one. There's one I'm dealing with I had a couple of years ago that I still have not gotten the revelation on, but I can see it just as clear as day. But I want to show you something, Numbers 12 and 6. Numbers 12 and 6, and he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make known, will make myself known unto him in a vision and speak unto him in a dream. I could tell you, and see, this is why I'm kind of, it kind of makes me feel bad because I should have been developing this side of my ministry a long time ago. I remember when I was first called into ministry, the first church I joined, I was in the Air Force, I didn't stay there long. But one night, I had a dream about these people that came in the church. And it was vivid, colors, speech, and everything. It was just a dream, but for some reason, it stayed with me. And so we went to church, and this was on a Wednesday night. They had a small Bible study on a Wednesday night. And, uh, and I was sitting in church, and every single one of those people in that dream walked in just like the picture. It was the most, they walked in. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not the ministering preacher at that time. It would have been out of order for me to get up and say anything. Y'all, do y'all hear what I just said? Because I'm telling you, there's rules to this, you see. And God is not a God of confusion. Well, why did God give me that dream? Training. It's all it was training. I remember when we first started our ministry. Oh man, I wanted my family to be with me so bad. I cried and cried because they didn't want to go and, and, and they stayed where they were and I cried. My heart was crushed. 
and I had a dream one night, and God showed me this dream. I've told you all about this before. That was full of fruit. And have you ever seen those machines that shake pecan trees? It's a big, well, you couldn't see the machine, but the tree just started shaking just like this. Everything fell to the ground except for two or three pieces of fruit. And then God spoke to me in my dream. He says, don't worry about what's on the ground. He said, the few pieces that are on the tree are all I'm going to need to get you where I want to go. It was, when I had that dream, I woke up, and it was like somebody came and lifted a burden off of my shoulders and put that burden somewhere else because God speaks to us in dreams. Now, I'm going to tell you the last dream that I had because there's several of them, but I'm going to tell, let me tell you one more. I went back to Greenville, Florida in a dream, in a vision. I went back to Greenville, Florida, and the house that my father built where I grew up in, I saw the house. I walked up to the house. We didn't have a, a garage. We had a carport back in those days. You just pulled the car into the carport. I walked into the carport because that was the way that we went into the house and you opened the door and you went into the kitchen. That was the first thing. So in this dream, I'm back there at the house. I'm walking in and I open the door. And when I go in, instead of my house, and I remember this house is maybe 1,300 square feet, very small house. When I walk into this house, everything is white. The ceilings are 20 and 30 foot ceilings with all types of ornate uh, lighting. Gold was everywhere. There were rooms everywhere, and I just began to weep and to weep and to weep. And God said, Whoo, he said, what's inside of you is bigger than what people see on the outside. Now, I'm going to tell you the last one that I had. I had a dream, and Deborah and I were walking, and, and the closest thing I can get to it, it looked like Oregon, walking in an Oregon forest. And we were walking uh, on this road, and it was a clay road, and we were walking. We were holding hands when we were walking. It was in the afternoon, in the evening. And there was a bench there, and we were kind of tired, and we sat down on this bench. And then when we looked, there was this, like a lake in a pond, but it was clear, but the waters were green. But it was clear, and the bottom was clay made out of pavement. And when I walked over to look at it, it was funny because on the edge, there were these bass fish all the way around the whole lake, but they were small ones like this. Then I stood back and said, whoa, look at all of those fish. And behind that row of fish, there were other bass fish, but like if these were this size, the other ones were this side. And that was another level. I said, oh, God, what is this? And then behind them, there was another row of fish that was even bigger. And then out in the middle of the lake, there was this space. There was nothing. And there were four large fish. Have you ever seen a Goliath grouper? Anybody? A Goliath grouper is as big as a Volkswagen. They had four of those fish in the center, and they stood, one here, one here, one here, side by side. And whatever way they turned, it controlled the movement of the other fish. And then all of a sudden, they turned a particular way, all of the waters receded, and these four fish came out, and it was a hill that went up. Rivers flowed downstream. This river was flowing. I'm going to get it. He's going to tell me what it's about. But this river flowed upstream, and those four big fish, when they began to move, all of the other little ones got behind it. And when they turned and went upstream, they all went upstream. And then when you looked back at the lake, the lake was empty. Now, to this day, I have no idea. Maybe the Lord talking to some of y'all and, and, and telling y'all what the dream means, but don't call me with no crazy stuff now because <laughs> it's got to bear witness with my spirit. If you, you know, calling me, telling me something that doesn't bear, because once have I spoken, twice have I heard thee. Which means if you're giving me revelation on something, the Spirit of God should have already given me an unction or something to let me know that we're on the same page. Does that make sense to you? Oh, Lord, you got me out here today. All righty. So, now, let's talk about timing and proximity. Go to 1 Samuel 3, 3, because timing and proximity has a lot to do with hearing the word of God, proximity. Proximity and timing. Pro we talked about it in first, uh, when we looked at the first scripture in Isaiah 50 and 4. Let's, let's read that. Let's read. And, and, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. Just leave that scripture up there. Now, Last week, I told you all something that was an error. Let me go back and straighten it. This lamp of the Lord is something that God told the children of Israel to build in the book of Exodus, and it was one of the pieces of furniture that was in not the Holy of Holies, but in the holy place in the sanctuary. You know it as a menorah. How many of you know what a menorah is? Okay, all right. So it has a base, and you have one main candlestick that goes up. It has like these little ornate bulbs, almond bl blossoms on it. And then on each side, three different 
things come out, right? And so there's seven lights that go across the top. Now, I want you to think about this because, again, you are sitting in a prophetic meeting, whether you know it or not. Now, what do you think those lights, those candles did? Don't be too deep. They gave light. <laughs> See, y'all try to get too spiritual and too deep. When you get too deep, you get all messed up. They gave light. It was dark. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have any of this. And so those seven candlesticks gave light. The entrance of thy word gives light. <laughs> Say, tell me a little bit more, Pastor. Go to Isaiah 11 and 2. When you talk about following God, those seven lights meant more than just seven lights. They represent the seven spirits of God. I'm going to say it again, because some of you, I'm not going to teach you all of this, because this in itself is a total, it's a, another one-hour teaching by itself. What are the seven spirits of God? And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The first one is the spirit of the Lord. And the next one is the spirit of wisdom. And the next one is understanding. And the next one is spirit of counsel. Morning by morning, he waketh. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I might know how to speak a word in season to him that's weary. Doesn't that sound like counsel? Some of you are tired right now and you need a fresh word. You need a prophetic word from God to help you go. When I got tired and I was ready to quit, you know what made me keep going? A prophetic word. Deborah and I talked about this the other day. When I was in transition and we were getting ready to start this church, I was so down. I had behaved so stupidly and silly, and I just didn't want to do nothing. And uh, the Southern Baptists had sent a preacher by that afternoon. They were, uh, again, reconciling, uh, trying to, 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 to mend the breach between slavery and, and, and Afro-Americans. They, and they said, well, we'll pay you. We'll get you started, da 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 da, da. And when they left, it just didn't feel right. You, you remember? And so this was a Sunday afternoon, and I was laying around the house depressed and, and beating myself up. And Deborah said, I thought you said the Lord told you to go in, to so-and-so's church. I don't go. I don't feel like it, you know. So we got up and we jumped in the Astro van, and they were already having church when we got there. I said, way back in the back, because I really didn't feel like being there. But I had already told Deborah the Lord told me to go. But how many of you know you don't always want to go where the Lord tells you to go? So I'm sitting back there, copacetic and whatnot, and they're doing their thing, you know. And this guy looks at me. He says, sir, he said, uh, he said, come up. He said, the Lord wants to talk to you. I looked around like that because I was on the last row. But I know he wasn't talking to me, not in the shape. I, he said, I want you to come up. Call me in there, bro. Man, when that man finished talking to me, I was in a mess. He, to he whispered in my ear, told me what I had done what was happening in the spirit, and how I was trying to be stopped. And then he said this. He said, don't worry about any of it. He said, God told me to tell you that he's about to bless your future endeavors. And I just broke down and cried. And then he called me, and he whispered something in my ear that only me and God, same thing with that blade prophesied to Deborah. What I'm trying to tell you is, you see, when you get, sometimes you get to places where you're just tired. You, you, your get up and go just gets up and leaves. And when God has something critical for you to do, he will send a word that will, he gives power to the faint. And to those that have no might, he renews your strength. And what that man said to me was exactly what I needed to hear. I'm walking in it. I'm living in it. You don't understand how powerful a prophetic word is. And you have to know my heart. Because I told God, I said, God, before I teach something wrong, kill me and take me home. And I stand by it right now. I would rather go home and be with the Lord than not spend time laboring before God and make sure I have an accurate word from God before I give it to you so that I don't have you running off half-cocked and looking stupid. Okay. So... He has those, the candlestick. Now, this is something else, timing and proximity. What did that candlestick do? Have y'all ever read this? The candlestick in the evening was lit, and it burned all night long. They put enough oil in, the, the, the priest would come in and check on it, but normally it burned straight through until the early morning light, and it went out. So when it says air, the lamp of the Lord went out, 
what God is trying to tell you is this took place at a certain time. And guess when it was? Early in the morning. Early in the morning. Okay? There's something about God and the Spirit of God where he traffics and moves when things are still. The Bible says that the Lord appeared again unto Samuel at Shiloh. Research where Shiloh, Shiloh means tranquil, peaceful. You see, in order for God to speak to you, he's got to quiet stuff down. Let me give you a good example. Joseph was messed up when Mary came home and said, I'm pregnant from the Holy Ghost. That messed Joseph up. Now, now remember, he's a senior guy married to a young girl, and now his young wife has come home saying, I am pregnant, and, uh, and you don't know the daddy. <laughs> His name is the Holy Ghost. That messed Joseph up because now he's got scandal that he has to deal with, and he also has to deal with the law. And by law, she, she would have been stoned, and he didn't know what to do, but the Bible says he was a good man. Now, watch this. The Bible says that the Lord came to him not while he was awake and dealing with his... Y'all never read this? He didn't come to him and deal with him when his mind was preoccupied with the drama that he... The Bible says he waited until he went to sleep, and God came and he spoke to him in a dream. You see, and, and this is why the Lord speaking to Samuel at Shiloh is important. You need to learn how to quiet yourself. Sometimes you are, you know what I've learned as a pastor? I don't always have to be available to you. Deborah will tell you I carry my phone everywhere. And when I don't have it, I have on my watch, which is connected to my phone. And one day the Lord spoke to me. He said, you don't always have to be available for them. I would rather you be available for me. And so I'm saying that to say this. Sometimes you've got to disengage from stuff and, and, and people. I'll be back. You know, don't, don't stop calling. I want to keep you encouraged, but I'm not going to talk. But you know, what I'm saying is I, I'll be back. Learn how to get somewhere and get still so that you can hear God. You don't know how important this is to me. We had a, we had a little grandson a couple of weeks ago, and he spent the night. He something else. <laughs> Y'all saw him washing the car the other day? He's washing the car. He called me Papa. And uh, Deborah was trying to tell him, said, you time to get, to get ready. For, and, and he did. He was a good little but, but my thing is, carve out time for God. You make time for everybody else, for your job and everything else. But have, Lord, what is this thing with the yellow you talking to me about today? But uh, you, 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 you've got to carve out time for God. And, and get still so that you can, uh, you can hear what the Lord is saying. Amen? Hmm. Okay. Now, the other thing was proximity. James 4 and 8. When you find out where he slept, the Bible says he slept near the ark of God. Now, he couldn't sleep where the ark was because no man could go in there. He would have died. But he was in the holy place. He was next to the chamber where the ark was. And um, the Bible says if you draw nigh to God... When God is close to you, when anyone is close to you, they don't have to yell to get your attention. Whisper. How many of you remember the prophet Elijah when he was running from Jezebel? And you remember one time he went up in a cave and he isolated himself from all of the other prophets. And um, while he was in the cave, <laughs> the word of the Lord came unto Elijah saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? And then there were several other things that happened. There was a storm, big old storm. He went outside because he thought the voice of God was in the storm. And guess what? It wasn't a storm. Then there was an earthquake that shattered rocks and everything. He went outside because he thought God. Then there was a firestorm. He went outside and he didn't hear God. And then there came to him something that was a still, small voice. That's where you hear God. It's a still, it's a, it's a whisper. I love you. Everything's going to be all right. If God is yelling to you, you're a long way from God. He doesn't yell to people that are close to him. And if you really want to get close to him, engage his word more. The more you engage, he said, I, see, because what you're showing God is you're drawing nigh to him. And God says, if you really want to get close to me, if you, how many of you really want to know the voice of God? You really want to hear it. He said, if you draw nigh to me, he said, I will draw nigh to you. Now, because we're teaching about this, I was telling Deborah we've been talking about this all week. Okay. 
When you talk about hearing God, this is why you need someone that's a mentor or someone to go before you to help you understand what you were hearing. You remember he went to Eli? Okay, now, why is that? I need somebody with a concordance to help me. Paul says, there be many voices in the world, all of them without significance. He says, and all of them, not, none of them are without significance. Find that scripture. There be many voices that have gone out. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, this is the good stuff. Now, this is, this is not the good stuff. This is the warning stuff. Everything that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. Do you remember when Moses went before Pharaoh and he had a staff in his hand? And the Lord told him, or he threw down the staff, right? And what happened? It turned into a serpent. Pharaoh was not impressed at all. Pharaoh did. Now, you, you would think if somebody has never seen it, oh, what is that? Surely that miracle would have made him say, your God is the most high God. I've never seen anything like that. That was not Pharaoh's response. Pharaoh knew some folks that were over there in the occult doing some other stuff. You know, he said, he said okay, hey, bring my guys in here. <laughs> and they brought his guys in here. And guess what? They threw down their sticks. Guess what? Turned into a snake too. But guess what? Moses' snake ate their snake. And Moses reached down and picked up the snake by the tail, and it became a staff all over again. Paul was in Philippi. I think it was Paul and Barnabas. May have been Paul and Sasu and Philippi. And when they went into the city, day one, the Bible says there was a woman there who made her masters much gain. <laughs> and she was speaking with a spirit of divination. I'm telling you this because these things, everything that God has, the devil has a counterfeit. And she followed Paul in those. And, for many, and this is what she declared, de declared. These be great men of God, which do show us the way of salvation. It's in your Bible. She didn't do it one time. The Bible says she followed them several days, saying the same thing. Now, why did it take several days? Okay, here's another scripture. All right, let's, let's get this one. Let me go. I have that one. Put that up, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Find the one in Hebrews that says, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you need the one teacher again. But strong meat belongs to those who are full age, who have their senses exercised to discern good from evil. Find that for me. It's in Hebrews, uh, I want to say around 6 or something. Find that one for me. But look at this one. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and that is the truth. Okay? <laughs> That's why some of y'all go to psychics. That's why some of y'all, I told y'all, stop burning that sage because when something jumps out of the spiritual arena and says something to you, you're going to knock a hole in the wall trying to get out of the house. You are dibbling and dabbling in areas that you do not know anything about. You open the door for these demons to get into your house and harass you. Notice I didn't say get into your life. If you're a believer, they cannot possess you. I said get into your house. There is demonic harassment and vexation. Okay? Now, so it says there, there, there may be, um, dog, y'all, let me, let me finish the first one, then we'll go back. I didn't get finished with many voices. Okay? Um, can can y'all go back to the other one? What was it? Anyway, y'all read it. It talks about there be many voices. There's many voices. I'm going to tell y'all a story. It's a true story. I don't see Frank in no hey, hey, back there. Um, my daddy, one time, and my mother, I was a little boy, but I'll never forget this. There was a guy in Georgia, in Donaldsonville, Georgia. His name was Dr. Dallas Moore. Lift your hand if you know what I'm talking about. People would get in vans and buses and drive overnight to get an audience with Dr. Dallas Moore. I never will forget it because I was a little boy. We stayed overnight. We stayed in the car outside in his front yard. And as kids, you know, we were running around playing until our parents went in <laughs> to see Dr. Dallas Moore. Now, he went under the guise of being a Christian man. And they said when you went in, he had candles burning here in two buckets. You were supposed to put an offering in the bucket. And, uh, and what my parents went there for is my mother wanted to have a child. I was adopted. She wanted to have a natural. This is a true story. Okay. Went to see Dr. Dallas Moore. Okay. He gave them a pouch of something. Have you all ever seen the, the red paisley bandanas that you tie up your head with? Well, he put it in a pouch. It was like potpourri. See, I, 
They used to call me a progen child. A progen child was when your parents left you all in the drawers looking at everything. I was progen. I progged up on some stuff I shouldn't have progged up on, but I was progen, okay? And I always wondered what that little bag was. Check this out. Not long after the visit, at 40-something years old, my mother conceived. Okay. Um, and people went there so that he could speak into their lives. Now, as I look back on it as an adult, something about that didn't seem right. But he was hearing from somewhere. Did you hear what I just said? He was communicating with somebody somewhere. In the spiritual realm, there are all types of voices. And until you get rooted in the things of God, be careful what voices you listen to because not every voice is the voice of God. If I come in here and I tell Edna and John, y'all, the Spirit of God says that you all are not supposed to be married. John is supposed to be married to sister so and so and so. First of all, they're going to cuss me out first because they know that I ain't going to tell them nothing like that. But do you know how many people have had their lives ruined because they went to a ministry where there was supposed to be a prophetic anointing and somebody supposedly prophesied into their life and now their, their faith has run aground. It's shipwrecked. They've left church. Don't want to have, there's many voices. Let me get deep. How many of you have ever heard of this brother, Manessa Jordan? Raise your hand. This boy, when he first started, boom, calling out phone numbers, names. He was accurate. Find him now. You're going to see a little guy sitting on a pillow in a temple, legs crossed, hair braided, looking like a woman, talking about the spirit is the same as chi. Look it up. It's on Google. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll give you a minute. Look it up on your phone right now. Okay. This boy has gone crazy. What I'm trying to tell you is there are many voices. This is why the Word of God is a foundation. Everything has to be built upon the revealed will of God that we have in His Word. There is a foundation and there are walls. There's a framework. Anything that's not built upon that that goes outside of those walls of God's Word, you got to throw that away. I don't care how deep it is. I don't care how precise it is. I don't care if they told you your address, your name, your grandmama's address. I don't care. If it goes off the rails, you will not know unless you have a working knowledge of the Word of God. Say, wait a minute. People in Africa, I've been there on several trips. They have an acute spiritual sense that's greater than people here. Okay. Yeah, but they listen to some strange voices. Okay. And when I talk to you about levels, have you ever heard this for every level? There's a different devil. Now, some of y'all are not going to believe what I'm about to say. There are some devils that deal There are other devils that deal with people that have a pastoral anointing. There are other demons that function and specialize in bothering people that have an apostolic on evangel. So if you don't minister in one of those offices and you try to step over into one of those offices and you try to minister from a place that you haven't been anointed, you're going to have a problem. That's why when the seven sons of Sceva, <laughs> they tried to cast out a devil because they saw Paul doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Go out there messing with the devil and not knowing what you do. And you know, that de- know what they said? They said, Paul, no, we know Paul and we know Jesus. We've been in their arena, but we ain't never seen you over here in their office. Y'all missed what I just said, didn't you? We've dealt with them, but we've never seen you in this space. How dare you come over into this spiritual space? And the Bible says that one man beat the clothes off of seven men. They left naked. Now, I've been in some fights in my life. I've won a few, and I've lost a few, but I can stand before you today as a man of God. Nobody has ever beat Marvin Jackson naked. I'll run before you beat my clothes off. And for y'all folk that are burning this sage 
and out here bothering with these, uh, these uh, signs. Of, I'm a Leo, and I'm cancer. You are bothering with things that you are not equipped to bother with. If you want to know something, go to God. Why would you insult God <laughs> by consorting with devils? Almost done. Okay. Woo. Ephesians 1 and 17. All right, before we do that, let's get 1 Samuel 3 and 7. Y'all getting anything out of the Word of God today? Um, 1 Samuel 3, 7. Next 30 days. Watch what's going to happen in the next 30 days. Watch what's going to happen to some of y'all with your dreams and whatnot. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, look at this. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Read it with me. Wait, y'all doing that special reading. Let's start. Come on, let's start. Go. Now, we looked at um, 1 Samuel 3 and 20, where it says that the Lord appeared unto to Samuel again at Shiloh, and the Lord revealed himself to him by his word. Um, but I want to show you something about revelation. A re some things can be taught. Some things have to be caught. I'm going to say it again. Some things can be taught. Some things have to be caught. How many of you have ever been here? Most of you have been, and, and you witnessed me minister with word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Okay. Now, let, let me tell y'all, and this is important, okay? My pastor, Rob, where's Rob in those? Rob and Adrian here? Mike Mitchell, they know him. We were all in the same church, and all the same church together. I had come out of the, the Baptist experience when I met Pastor Mitchell. And um, the first time that I went there, it was new because I had, my experience was never lifting my hands and doing that. that. We just didn't do that. That was not our practice. Okay. And so this was all new. And, you know, I got to the point where my hand kind of went up a little bit like here. And I raised them up and finally I was wide open, you know. And um, he had no knowledge of computers. Okay. And I've never been to a church where I didn't serve. That's just not in my DNA. That's the way I was raised. If you're going to sit there, serve, okay? And so I introduced him to computers the day he died. He called me his apostle of computing. Mike Mitchell.